Good evening. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Makia Majrashi, President Saudi Patient Experience Club under the Saudi Society of Health Administration. And I will be serving you today as a moderator and panelist. You will be hearing a presentation from Dr. Sultan al Houthi and Dr. Ghadir Banafar. They will be speaking to us about training healthcare, how to empower patients and families in preventing medication error. Dr. Sultan is a Vice President, Saudi Society of Family and Community Medicine. He is an experienced, value-driven family medicine physician with administrative history of working in the public, private, and nonprofit sector. A Master of Healthcare Administration, Executive Master of Insurance focused on quality improvement and health economics. Dr. Ghadir is an alert and monitoring expert in medication errors department at Saudi FDA. She, said she received her PharmD degree from King Abdelaziz University in 2010. She completed a two-year clinical pharmacy residency in 2013 at King Abdelaziz Medical, Medical Jeddah, Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. In 2017, she completed her fellowship in safe medication management at ISMB. She served as a medication safety specialist at corporate level at Saudi Medication Safety Center of Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. And she is an active member at several regional and corporate committees overseeing medication safety related activities. Now, moving along to our session, please welcome with me Dr. Sultan Al Houthi and Dr. Ghadir Banasir to deliver the presentation at this a very timely subject. For our audience, please, you can keep your questions and answer in the Q and A icon so our speaker will answer them clearly. Over to you, Dr. Sultan and Dr. Ghadir. Thank you very much, uh, Makia, for your introduction. Uh, <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Ghadir, and I, I would like to thank you uh, to, uh, to organize this event and hopefully uh, to have informative uh, webinar. Uh, before I start, I would like to, to thank uh, four key people uh, for uh, this uh, webinar, if you allow me. So first of all, uh, I would like to, to, to thank the main key person of this successful of uh, this webinar, per se, and every webinar that that's person, that's important person, is you, uh, our beloved and dear participant. Thank you for detecting time to participate and engage in such activity. Uh, this is something yeah, we appreciate it and admire it. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, second of all, I would like to thank my colleague, Dr. Ghadir, our uh, moderator, Makia, and the amazing people behind the stage, uh, Hiba, uh, Rima, Rania, Nov, Sami, and everybody. Thank you very much for, for your effort. Uh, also, I would like to, to thank uh, the Saudi Patient uh, Safety Center, uh, Dr. Yasser Aska, and all the staff for uh, their effort in patient safety topics. This is a valuable and very informative. Lastly, I would like, on behalf of all of us today, uh, to thank the all healthcare uh, professionals all over the world, and especially those uh, in our beloved country, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we appreciate your effort. Much, much appreciated. Uh, today, we'll speak about uh, uh, a very important topic in training the healthcare, how to empower patients and families in preventing uh, medication errors. This is the outline that we will cover, inshallah. I'm going directly to, to part one. We divided our uh, webinar to three parts. So part one will speak about patient safety uh, survey uh, from public uh, perception. I, uh, before I start, I would like to highlight on this uh, main uh, message, which is blockbuster drug of the century. Just keep it in mind. So I would love to start with this uh, poll, please. Uh, if you participated all, uh, we would like to hear from you. We would like to know uh, your opinion, uh, whether uh, you have uh, participated in National Patient Safety Survey uh, that designed for public. Have you ever participated? Yes or no? Can you please answer the poll that will show uh, just now? Uh, in, in, in the screen. Kindly, 
just give us your opinion. If you have ever participated in patient safety survey that designed for public to understand their views and perspective on patient safety. While you're answering, uh, I would like to ask my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ghadir. Have you ever, Dr. Ghadir, participated in such uh, patient safety survey? Well, honestly, on a national level, I haven't uh, participated on patient safety survey designed for uh, public, but I would say for healthcare provider to get their perspective on patient safety, definitely, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, mashallah. So it seems that almost 50-50 of our participants that uh, participated in such a uh, survey. Oh, this is good. Very good. Uh, for those people who participated, please, please, if you want to share anything, any views, you know, any experience, just please uh, type it in the chat. We would love to hear. Uh, we would love to write, read it and to, to have your opinion in this regard. This will take us to our second question, our second bull, please. For those people who haven't participated in such survey, have you ever heard or came across any published uh, survey, patient uh, safety uh, survey designed for public. Can I have the bullet please control? Okay, yeah. this is uh, quite interesting. Quite interesting. Please share with us uh, your ideas and this regard we would like to, to read it. So our third uh, bull, uh, I would like to, to know uh, uh, among these challenges that display in the screen, uh, which one uh, you think is the most uh, challenges uh, in terms of uh, patient uh, related uh, engaging uh, uh, challenges? And I will speak about it a bit. What do you think, uh, Ghadir? Uh, can you give us your opinion, please? Well, I don't want anyone to get biased because I still see the screen for the poll is active. Uh, <laughs> so would you rather wait until we get the uh, uh, results for the poll question yeah, from the audience? Yeah, yeah. yeah fair, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, thank you, thank you for being just. <laughs> okay, I guess I get the results. Oh, quite interesting. Yeah. So honestly, I wouldn't say educational level um, I would say a different answer. If you still insist, I could say my opinion on that. Yeah, please, please, shoot. Well, well, okay. Uh, I would say I'm kind of like uh, lean toward cultural background. And mm -hmm. the reason I'm saying that because I'm, I'm kind of so convinced in, in, in the hardship in changing the culture. Um, the, the education level of, or improving or promoting the um, um, health um, principles is, is an easy task to do, that's in my opinion. But mm -hmm. changing the mindset of the culture, it's always the thing that could take so much efforts and time uh, to be able to change them. Uh, so I would go with cultural background, honestly. Okay, hey, uh, thank you. Thank you for your advancement on that. So this is, um, again, quite interesting, as uh, my colleague uh, Ghadir just mentioned. Um, we, we define or we categorize the challenges in engaging the patient in, in different uh, perspectives. So one of the perspectives is patient related and the other one is uh, healthcare uh, provider uh, related. So we believe in terms of patient related that this is the main four uh, challenges, cultural background. So different uh, people background uh, uh, and different culture affecting the patient, uh, you know, dealing uh, uh, in terms of uh, medication safety and medication errors. Uh, if we uh, if we take, uh, for instance, the, that people living in, in the cities versus people living in urban areas, uh, people who has um, who have this uh, you know, support, family support, or any kind of social support versus people who are um, uh, alone, uh, so how they can engage and how they can, um, uh, how they can, uh, uh, have this uh, organization and how the, uh, the, the level of uh, medication error uh, will be related to this uh, status. Uh, one more thing is educational level. So uh, people with different, with higher educational level uh, might have different 
uh, quite different uh, uh, dealing in the chain and challenges uh, with medication error versus people with lower uh, educational uh, level. Uh, health literacy, we'll speak about it in a bit. And as you can see here in cost uh, consideration, we are speaking here, uh, here about uh, different uh, medication, uh, medication that uh, expensive, uh, other medication uh, like uh, that uh, need uh, uh, special consideration, uh, fridge uh, based or room, tem uh, room temperature based uh, medication, all of these can affect uh, and, and be uh, a challenge uh, to engage it uh, with patient. Uh, lastly, in personal motivation, uh, patient who's taking medication for a long time versus patient who's taking a small course of medication. So we have this very interesting AHRQ, a supportant assessment tool. Uh, they have this symbol uh, indicators that covering these three uh, elements. So we have the behavior uh, element, uh, which contain the uh, um, incomplete or inaccurate, inaccurate sorry, uh, patient um, uh, registration form. So in the beginning of patient seeking for help, uh, their registration forms uh, of health needs, for instance, it has a very clear indication. Uh, frequently uh, missed appointments. This is, can show us or can lead us to, 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 to know the struggles that patients are facing. Uh, non adherence to medication regimens. So by asking directly questions to, to those patients, we can assist uh, their behavior and their health literacy uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, lack of follow through uh, with test or referral uh, appointments. Checking their system, checking their uh, compliance and their attendance and uh, their follow-ups, appointments, all of these are behavioral things. Next thing here is the responses to questions about medication uh, uh, regimen. So when a physician or any healthcare provider asks the patient to name the medication that the patient uh, uh, is taking, uh, if the patient uh, is unable to name the medication, this can you know, give us a clue uh, if the patient also uh, is in, unable, uh, unable to explain the purpose of uh, medication. We quite see it uh, very frequently in our practices, aren't we? And also, uh, if the patient is unable to explain timing or uh, medication administration, so patient is not sure, you know, how many times uh, should he or she uh, take the medication, and you know, uh, the the administration route. Uh, of, of the medication. Uh, moreover, of these, uh, these medication regimen uh, challenges is the patient that inability to, to identify medication names uh, from label or a bottle. Uh, a bottle. Uh, so he, he's reliable on someone, he's uh, dependent in this regard. So this is, can give us a clear uh, clue that patient having uh, health literacy and difficulties for, for uh, taking uh, medication uh, regularly. Lastly, the third indicator is the response to receiving uh, written uh, information. So when you ask a patient about, uh, tell us about uh, your medication, the, uh, the medication that you just brought to the, to the clinic or to the pharmacy. So the patient will have, sometimes uh, he or she might say that, uh, sorry, I forget my glasses indicating that patient uh, has difficulty uh, to, 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 to recall and to give you the, the clear, uh, the clear uh, instructions of the medication that he or she uh, received. Or some other patient might say that, uh, okay, doctor, uh, or okay, uh, pharmacist, uh, I'm fine. I will just confirm the medication. Just I went to, uh, I, I go to home. I will check that, that there. So he's not able to confirm it uh, right away. Uh, or it can be like, uh, let me take uh, uh, this home so I can discuss it with my children. So patient, patient, the patients are uh, reliable and other people to guide them uh, through uh, their uh, medication plan and to, to help them you know, with getting the, the, the medication. So all of these indicators can be uh, very quiet. Uh, 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 can be clue that direct us, you know, to, to the health literacy and how to, to, to engage patient in, in the care according to, to their needs, whether behavioral or whether that there is a difficulty uh, in responding to medication regimen or 
and receiving the, the written uh, information. So, as I told you uh, before that the challenges uh, that related to, to patient. Here, we have a challenges in engaging uh, patient, healthcare uh, providers related, uh, leadership uh, support. It's very interesting, Salaha. Uh, Ghadir, have you remember that we discussed about um, this element, leadership uh, support? You had a quite yes. uh, interesting point of view. Can you please share it with us if you don't mind? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's quite similar to my perspective on engaging patients and challenging and engaging patients um, from a patient-related perspective. I would still see that cultural uh, changes and, and leadership support is, it has to go hand by hand. I'm sure like most of the audience have heard about the just culture and all those big concepts, how it's, uh, like I'm just measuring those uh, in the same way. If you want to change the culture, it has to be driven from the top management down. So um, that's why I was saying leadership support and the first element you had on the slide and then the fourth one, the culture changes. Uh, to me, it seems like the, uh, it has to be the two top challenging uh, perspective in, in engaging healthcare uh, provider or are getting healthcare provider engaging patients. Thank you very much, Ghadir, for your uh, insight. So this is very valid, right? Yani, uh, sometimes that the challenge, the main challenge is getting the leadership support. Uh, it's, uh, yani, if we can speak about it uh, all at the same time, uh, that uh, the healthcare providers, they don't have a suitable or enough time for seeing patients. They have back-to-back -back patients or the pharmacists, they have, you know, a loaded uh, patient waiting in queues. So they, would, they, would, they wouldn't be able to give each patient uh, his or her uh, time to discuss and to ask um, uh, suitable uh, or to ask their, uh, to raise their concern and their questions. So to, to, to have leadership uh, support and facilitate things and will improve things, they uh, might uh, support the staff with the suitable uh, tools, uh, finding clinics, you know, uh, opening lines with the, with the patient for more engagement, uh, having, you know, uh, more staff that uh, might help or dedicated uh, people uh, to engage patient uh, in, in, in these uh, steps and overcome these challenges. So leadership support, one of the key uh, challenges, uh, time, uh, for for medical uh, concerns, personal stories of uh, from patients, uh, and participating in interdisciplinary team. You know the difficulty of founding this uh, team to a multidisciplinary team to 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 be around patient to answer patient queries to tackle you know the patient's concern from different uh, perspectives. And culture change and some culture uh, that. Uh, you know, relying a bit on uh, paternalism, uh, relationship with the healthcare, uh, I mean, between healthcare practitioner and uh, patients, uh, not uh, patient-centered care, it's uh, uh, physician or healthcare practitioner-centered care, and how to engage patient. This is a, a challenge and difficulty. Uh, compensation uh, for, for mistakes, for other issues. Uh, emotional, physical, spiritual, and psychological support. Lacking of that is, is a challenging, you know, for, for, for healthcare practitioners and for, for patients at the same time. So we have this very nice speak up uh, move uh, from the Joint Commission. And we have, uh, this is very nice also patient safety caravan. Uh, this tools will speak about it inshallah later, but he, uh, I saw it as an opportunity to, to, to just mention it here. So we wouldn't forget it later. Uh, the manpower, the lack of the staff, all of these challenges uh, has a great uh, effect uh, in engaging uh, patients. Here, I would give the stage to my colleague uh, Ghadir to tell us uh, more about uh, any data she came across that uh, useful in this uh, regard. Ghadir, please. Um, hi. 
Well, I guess I was talking while I'm muted. That's still the, an ongoing issue since uh, Corona time. <laughs> well, uh, I was saying it's very interesting to see the results of the poll question that uh, Dr. Sultan have uh, showed to us. Uh, to me, it's, it's really interesting to see that almost 50% of the uh, audience have heard or participated in a patient safety survey. Um, while we're preparing for, for our talk today, uh, it, it was very interesting for me to see that the National Patient Safety Foundation, uh, which is an independent, um, a nonprofit organization, um, it, it's mainly concerned with advancing safety for both healthcare provider and, and patients. And it was developed uh, back in 1997. And back then they have created a survey to get the public views on uh, patient safety. And then can you just imagine that 20 years later, after 1997, in 2017, this um, institution or the National Patient Safety Foundation, they get merged with the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, in 2017. And since that time when they get uh, uh, this effort joined together, they have created the same survey again. And it was very interesting that the survey question were mainly remained the same but the uh, results and the public views has definitely changed. If you see the um, QR code on the right of the screen, uh, it will take you to the uh, full report from the survey back in, 20, uh, in 1997 and the second one in orange. So we're following the same theme for Patient Safety Day. Uh, the orange one should take you to the full report for the 2017 survey. Well, just to give you like a feel of the kind of survey question that was um, uh, mainly um, um, like uh, the, the participants were surveyed about. So they have covered a general, uh, the safety in general in some of the question and then what safety precautions, uh, what's their uh, insight on healthcare professionals uh, uh, engagement in patient safety, uh, some questions were about awareness of medical mistake, some were about experiencing uh, medical mistake, and some questions were mainly about the uh, tools for prevention of such uh, medical mistake. Well, um, let me tell you something that might be very interesting that the uh, public views um, in, the, um, in the US and, and like one of the questions that was really got my attention is, uh, throughout the years, so as I told you, between the two surveys, there has been two decades. So when the patient were surveyed in 1997, uh, they were thinking that um, the status of the patient safety over the last five years, since the time the survey was conducted, uh, they were thinking it's all equal. So they didn't thought there are any, uh, changing, uh, any changes in the patient safety level. Um, and uh, they were thinking like, uh, we haven't improved. Uh, the same percentage of uh, surveyed people were thinking, oh, we're getting better. Uh, some of them were thinking, uh, no, we're getting worse. That's back in 1997. When they get surveyed again in 2017, uh, their views remained the same except in one uh, part. And, and it's, it's quite interesting that they have done it in 2017 differently. So when they asked the question, how do you see the patient safety? Is it getting better or stayed the same or getting worse? In 2017, they have segregated the, um, uh, the uh, surveyed partic uh, uh, people participants into those who have experienced medical error uh, from those who didn't experience medical error. And you can definitely guess, the people who get medical errors were thinking, oh, we are getting worse. But other than that, their views remained the same. Uh, the same percentage, almost the same, were thinking we're getting better, the same almost were thinking we're staying the same, and getting worse definitely was also uh, there and with the same percentage. But let me ask you now uh, if... Um, you can move to the next slide, uh, Dr. Sultan. Thank you. So we were, if like definitely, when I when we were preparing for the presentation, people were thinking we're promoting for the a new iPhone uh, released from Apple, but definitely it's not the case here. We are asking <laughs> if <laughs> the question here is, um, have you heard about the proverb when Apple uh, rotten the or spoils the whole uh, barrel? 
So that's what was in mind um, when I put the apple here. Um, like now we're thinking in the mindset of the patients, we're not healthcare provider. Just like imagine if you're a patient participating in a survey, would you say that when rotten apple spoils the whole barrel? Meaning, do you think one um, factor has led to medical errors or medication errors or a medication errors are a result of multifactorial uh, issues? So that's basically the pull question here. If we can get the pull question, please. And I would love to hear from you. Again, I would remind you, this is from public views. It's not your view as a medical uh, uh, health uh, provider. Well, let's see the results. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, you think that uh, the public would assume that errors are multifactorial. So it's very interesting that you think the population will think in that way. So definitely, I'm happy to see this result if well, our audience and definitely our audience are all healthcare provider. So if we can move to the next slide, I will, I will share with you the results uh, from the uh, survey that was conducted in 1997 and compared with 2017. So in this table on the left side is the table uh, is representing the results from the 1997 when people were surveyed about the um, what kind of factors that contributed to the errors. So mainly they were thinking the carelessness and negligence of the healthcare provider was the main leading cause of error. And that was mentioned as a single factor of leading to errors. But it was very interesting that 20 years later in 2017, when the survey was conducted again, that the public were thinking several factors have contributed to the errors. So the list you, you are seeing on the graph on the right side, it's, um, it's showing that healthcare providers do not pay attention to details as the most uh, frequently selected uh, uh, reason or factor for medical errors to happen. But like 5% only from all the participating, um, uh, 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 the people who were surveyed were answering as identified uh, a single uh, reason to error. So only 5% said only one reason is the reason, the cause of an error to happen, but the average number of reasons or factors contributing to the error was seven. So that was the average number of factors the people were selecting from a list of 23 uh, items or factors that could lead to errors in the survey. And maybe you, you want to know even the number of the participants in the survey. So in 2017, the number was 2,536 of people were surveyed. And uh, those who were asked this question were uh, the one who experienced uh, medical uh, errors only. Well, uh, can we go to the next slide? Well, learning about all of that from the survey and how it, like we have seen, uh, how it's multifactorial and all it has been even introduced to you from the uh, uh, part one, I would like to go further to part two and ask you uh, this question before we start with the uh, engagement tools. So I would like to know if you would rather encourage patients and families to search for answers or you would rather assess them to ask the right questions? So that's a pull question and I would love to hear your opinion. So do you want them to go Google everything and learn more about their medical condition, about their medication? Or do you want them to have the tools to ask the right question from healthcare provider? If we can have the pull question, please. If you allow me Ghadir, to, to act here. Yes, yeah, sure. So, yeah, so, yeah, and I'm not like you. I will give my answer straight. So for, <laughs> for C okay. of argument, I would say searching. Searching, okay. Yeah, for sake well, of argument, I would like to hear your opinion on that. Well, you know, there, are, there is a very interesting article about um, embracing Dr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so maybe you're embracing Dr. Google and there is definitely um, uh, studies um, that have supported this opinion, definitely. Um, and one of the studies was conducted by Harvard Medical School and it was in favor of searching. Okay, so yeah. let's wait for, for a moment for people yeah, to sure. give us their opinion. 
Well, we have uh, 850 currently participants, and I would love to hear 850 answers. MashaAllah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my eyes on the numbers. Allah <laughs> barik. <laughs> Well, we get the results. We have 32% saying uh, searching for an answer and the majority voted for asking right questions. So let me say that's definitely uh, what I would even encourage here, uh, supporting the uh, patients with the right tools to ask the right questions. And this will take us to the next slide, which is tools to uh, engage patients. So. Again, we're following the theme. So whatever in blue will be uh, my part and then the orange will be Dr. Sultan's part. I will be covering the basic questions and the ISMP five questions, uh, ISMP Canada five questions to ask about your medications. So uh, the basic questions, we get almost a total of 14 uh, questions and that's from um, Dr. Cohen uh, a book about medication errors. And definitely I would promote for those basic questions about medications because our whole webinar today is about empowering them to prevent medication errors. So believe it or not, we still struggle with patients not knowing their uh, medications because differences in brand names. So um, what are the brand and generic names of the medication is definitely one of the top questions we want to hear about. So it's very interesting to see that like since even all that time back then when all this list of basic questions was developed, we still this, uh, see those uh, elements as valid because we haven't really um, got there yet with uh, patient uh, health literacy. So that's definitely will be one of the major questions we want to teach our patients uh, is to ask about brand and generic name and essentially differentiating between those two. Uh, what's the purpose of the medication? Uh, we're talking here about indication. Uh, what's the strength and dosage uh, form of the medication? Uh, what are the possible adverse effects? What should I do if they occur? Because all those kind of questions will help with uh, the patient adherence and Dr. Sultan will cover that later on. Um, most of the people, they just quit their medication because they have experienced an adverse effect. They don't know that it's kind of uh, a well-known thing on the uh, like the package insert, it's already uh, listed there as one of the uh, relevant um, side effect of this medication. And they would think it's something wrong going with them. Is there any other medication I should avoid while using this product? And definitely that's about drug-drug interaction, especially if we have an issue with polypharmacy. And that's mostly with our um, like uh, chronic uh, diseases uh, patients. I'm, a, I am allergic to something, should I take this medicine? And that's definitely a great question. You want to keep that on your list when you uh, teach your patient or empower them with tools. How long should I take this medication and what outcome should I expect? Because sometimes their expectation from certain drug, if it's not met, then they will stop taking that medic medication and it will affect their uh, compliance and definitely want to keep their expectation realistic. Uh, then when is the best time to take this medication? And like one of the things that I have in mind is, for example, with warfarin, and uh, it's like most of the hospital will be uh, promoting for 6 p.m. or evening doses because they want to get an accurate INR level and so on. So if there are certain times they want or before the meals, for example, the rapid acting insulin and those kind of medications, there are always this question will be always valid to ask um, if it has to be taken, for example, when the first time when you wake up. So uh, all those kind of like thoughts will, will be in mind uh, of the healthcare provider if the, uh, the patient asks those questions. How should I store the medication? So um, and like, um, especially with the weather here in, in, uh, in Saudi, uh, people always tend to put everything in the fridge. They don't trust uh, anything like a room temperature. Uh, the storage uh, temperature, when they say it's a room temperature, it's 25, but we never get like to 25 when it's somewhere around here. So those kind of like questions and, and uh, like entertaining those discussion with patients will definitely get them empowered more and more. Uh, what do I do if I miss a dose? And uh, definitely you don't want to get into an error because they get a duplicate dose just because they thought that's the right act 
because I forget the dose, I take uh, an extra one. Should I avoid any foods while taking this medication? And that's definitely uh, one of the um, uh, things you want to uh, discuss with the patients because of the drug food interactions. Uh, I'm also taking this medication, which I got from another pharmacy. Can I take both safely? So this could uh, and reveal things relevant to like different uh, brands of the same generic name. Um, is this medication meant to replace any other drug that I'm already taking? Uh, so um, that's uh, definitely a valid question because sometimes if you're prescribing a drug from another, uh, from the same class, but another generic name, uh, this could highlight um, the uh, opportunity of avoiding um, concomitant use of two uh, similar medication. May have written information about this drug. Uh, again, if we um, think about what Dr. Sultan was talking about, uh, health uh, literacy, and sometimes they would prefer to have someone else reading that for them. Uh, they don't feel really confident. They understand everything, and they want to take their time reading those information. Then uh, this is one of the things you could do to support them. Um, the next one is the ISMP Canada. So ISMP Canada have, uh, had this released um, several years ago, honestly, I don't recall when, but the five questions to ask was all about empowering a patient with the, question, the right questions about their medications. So um, they have, if you see the um, screenshot I placed on the left side of the uh, slide, uh, this is all about like um, endorsing uh, those questions about uh, uh, the medication, all about what kind of things they need to monitor if they're properly taking them. And those are kind of like, like flyer and you can print them in your institution. Uh, they have also, uh, it's, it's uh, one of the really good thing, they have it also translated in Arabic. And if you go to, uh, if you just scan the uh, barcode on the screen, it should take you to uh, the ISMP Canada uh, website. Uh, and definitely so many, there are one of the tabs on the top of the page, it says endorsements. And you can see there are several local, uh, I mean, hospitals in Saudi Arabia that has endorsed this tool. So if you are one of the, or your organization want to adopt this um, tool, you can uh, um, like mail them and ask to uh, get your copy with your hospital logo on the uh, flyer and you can distribute it to your patients and your uh, facility. So that's one of the amazing thing um, I have seen myself. Uh, and it's, it's very interesting. Like everything you see here in English, like uh, changes, they translated like uh, all those like elements of the five questions, it's all uh, translated in Arabic for uh, the uh, Arabic speaking uh, patient. And that's definitely majority of our population. And um, more recently, they get the same five questions from ISMP Canada translated uh, or let me see, simplified uh, rather than translated for the kids to grasp the um, concept. So they're now working on, on, on patients from the earlyhood of their like uh, age uh, to empower them. So uh, if you see like how friendly the one in the middle, the picture in the middle of the slide, it looks very friendly because the target here is, is kids. So, um, why do I need this medicine? When uh, do I take it? How long do I take it? So not only uh, they're working to engage adults, but also the um, the um, uh, children uh, to to be like more engaged in in their medication management rather than just relying on their uh, caregiver or working on that later on when they're adults. So um, I guess I will leave the stage for Dr. Sultan to speak more about other tools um, in the uh, empowering patients and engaging them uh, in uh, preventing medication errors. Thank you, Ghadir, appreciate it. So yes, continuation to what uh, uh, Ghadir mentioned earlier, the tools that will help in patient engagement. So that's me, let me speak here about uh, medication reconciliation and the brown uh, bag checkup. Uh, please guys, uh, can you please write in the chat, what do you believe, uh, what is medication 
reconciliation. Let me hear about it from you. What's application reconciliation? I'll give you a moment just to, to type in the chat. No. Medication reconciliation. When you hear this term, what does this mean? Okay, so Nahla saying that it's listing all the medication taken by the patient. Okay, fair enough. Trying my best to, to read the all the comments in the, in the chat. So, okay, so I will tell you uh, um, my understanding of medication reconciliation. It's the process of creating the most accurate list possible of all medication a patient is taking, including drug name, dosage, frequency, and route. Uh, and comparing that all against the physician admission, transfer, and or discharge orders. While this goal is to, to provide correct indication to the patient at all transition point uh, within the, the care provider. So this, uh, I got this definition from IHI, uh, of medication reconciliation. So we, we need to, to have this accurate list of patient uh, medication. We need to have this full information about the dose, route, frequency, uh, to, 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 to know the patient understanding for, for better outcome. Uh, we have this is very nice, uh, encourage patient to bring their medication. They call it a brown bag because they have brown bags there, but we might have different plastic bags also. So we should ask patient to, to provide all medication, all of it, all of it. I know that we have difficulties, some difficulties in some institutions that patient might have uh, multiple, uh, multiple uh, healthcare provider, uh, National Guard, uh, Sultan Medical City, uh, MOH. So they have different uh, physicians and different healthcare providers that they are seeking. So we need to encourage patients to bring all the medication uh, from different healthcare providers. And then we need to go uh, one by one to check the list of medication. Sometimes I believe that uh, most of us came across that patient taking medication uh, the, from, uh, from a healthcare provider, from one healthcare provider, and they are taking the same medication, but to different packages from another healthcare providers which can cause serious you know, complications. So we need to check the patient. And I would like to encourage patient frequently to bring their uh, medication and to, to, to let the healthcare provider aware of any changes or any addition, uh, remove, uh, removal of uh, their uh, medications from any healthcare providers. And this sometimes can be you know, uh, difficult uh, when the uh, care provided at home so be the case. So patient receiving this medication from MOH, for instance, and they have also a private home health care uh, uh, providers with different, you know, plan, uh, not updated. Uh, the the both, you know, providers not aware of the other plan. It some uh, it it might make a confusion state for 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 the providers and. For sure, it will make complication for the uh, patient. So yes, encouraging patient to bring their medication. Uh, we need to to check the medicine uh, list. The patient need to know uh, the medications that he's uh, or she receiving uh, daily, the timing, uh, the dose, uh, the route. Uh, everything need to be uh, to to be uh, uh, clear. Uh, here sometimes it can be you know confusing that the 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 the, the instructions that are given to patients. So for instance, patient taking uh, or the instruction of taking medication H, uh, is HIS or uh, BRN. We need to clear that very much. We need to clear it to make it clear to the patient so they can understand. Uh, I know you know from my experience that well, many many patients many patients. Uh, that taking medication like a routine, daily basis, though it's PRN. And when I ask them, uh, they say that we just received this medication, you know, with one line on 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 the back or in the in the package of the uh, of the medicine. 
you know, this, you know, uh, a style that we used to do or the, the pharmacist used to do that, that making, you know, lines on the package, one uh, meaning that it's one birthday, two, three, and so on. So when they noticed this line, they thought this is a daily basis rather than it's a BRN. Lastly, a useful tool is the reminders. Reminders uh, like uh, SMS. Uh, I know that uh, there is uh, quite uh, many uh, applications. Uh, since uh, Dr. Ghadir just brought the, the Apple before. So, and, and she mentioned that she's not promoting for Apple iPhone. I know for sure, since I'm using iPhone, that there is uh, many uh, applications in iOS, like medication reminder, uh, my therapy bill reminder, this all in English. Uh, I believe that uh, even Ministry of Health have something, uh, but I'm not quite sure if there is any uh, Arabic. Uh, so please, people, if anyone you know came across or heard about any Arabic tool uh, for reminding for medication, just you know, uh, just type it in the chat so people will be able you know, to, to, to know it and to, to spread this information. Okay, so the fourth uh, tool is medication adherence. Oh, this is a very, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, that to know, to minimize uh, the, the medication error, patient need to be adherent to medication. So when the patient is adherent, this is automatic, you know, uh, minimizing of any error. So what's the consequences of non-adherence? According to WHO, common sense, a phrase I just brought it from, or I just, you know, quoted from uh, WHO, that adherence have direct impact on the outcome. Yeah, as simple as this. Once people were adhered to, to, to the medical plan, once people are adhered to medical plan, they will have uh, a good uh, out, outcome. So uh, there is an interesting study that showed that 50% of hypertensive patients uh, will continue on medication uh, uh, for, for one year. 50% again will continue for one year. So we have, we have you know, uh, this is struggle with the years between people. And one of the consequences of, of non-adherence to, to medication can be like a prolongation uh, course of the illness. So this is the consequences of not adhering to, 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 to medication. Also, uh, we might have more symptoms, more complications, uh, more resistance to, to, to antibiotics, uh, more uh, hospitalization as a result. Uh, moreover, we might also have a progression or deterioration of the patient's case since uh, he's not adherent to, to the medication or to the treatment uh, plan. So why people are not adherent to medication? We have quite three reasons. For that, the knowledge uh, deficit. This is a one important thing that people who doesn't understand uh, the reason or the their case, they don't understand uh, the, the the diagnosis, the prognosis, uh, the medication, uh, basic things like medication on a dose, timing, you know, side effects. Uh, will be will have difficulty, you know, uh, of adhering to medication. So we need to to tell exactly the patient what are they are, what they are expecting, what they should have, what they should know, and a contact in case of any uh, concerns uh, uh, in the future. Uh, the other thing is the practical barriers. And. As I told you before, also my uh, colleague Ghadir mentioned that uh, practical barriers uh, for the, these medications that require, you know, special uh, uh, special uh, cases of saving uh, the medication, like uh, insulin, for instance, the refrigerator, the uh, medication that you know this antibiotic that require fluid, adding water to equalize the the potency of the medication. And, you know, uh, as I told you before, 
the that the 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 classic way of giving instruction of medication crossing lines on the uh, on the cover of the uh, medication of the medicine one line two line three lines and so on so this is sometimes this is might be a, a, a barriers for for adherence lastly attitudinal uh, barriers um, you know just this symbol that there is a something common or uh, or the, the, the there is a family or social uh, you know stress or pressure uh, to not take this medication because they believe that uh, they know someone else who take this medication and the medication cause uh, complication. So uh, some people might have this saying, I just said it in Arabic, that you know always ask someone who tried this before rather than to ask uh, a, a healthcare a practitioners. Uh, about this uh, medication. So we have this difficulty of attitudinal or cultural, as we uh, as we uh, discussed before, uh, to, to, to be adherent to, to the medication. Um, please, if anyone um, have, uh, has any idea, any other reasons we would like to read, just please uh, type it in the, in the chat. My colleague, Nadir, please tell us about the reporting. Sure. Uh, so uh, I guess it's all very interesting and uh, was framed in a very well way, Dr. Sultan. Thank you. But, you know, despite all what we are doing to engage the patient and create all those tools to prevent errors, we all know, like, as healthcare providers, that eventually errors are still happening. So um, we wish that we could get to the zero um, error, but it's not something that we could achieve. And I guess we all know the um, barriers to get there. But um, it's very important also to get patients engaged and speak up, um, uh, as Dr. Sultan mentioned. And one of those tools is if the patient gets ex uh, an experience uh, with an error, then they have to uh, report them. And that's even part of the uh, empowerment. So I guess by reaching to this level, uh, that patient feels uh, so safe that they could disclose this error. They have somewhere they could vent and, and put their reports and um, that will be really great in even um, reshaping our system and preventing errors in the future. So the uh, current like national level um, reporting system that allows the uh, consumer and patients to report is the Saudi vigilance system run by the Saudi Food and Drug Administration and Authority, sorry. Uh, it's called uh, Tayakput. And this is the um, QR code in the screen that you could scan and it will take you to uh, the page for the Saudi vigilance system. So we would love that if um, all of you promote this um, behavior of reporting uh, errors uh, to the uh, Saudi vision system, uh, especially if they are product related, uh, because that's something we really take in, um, like uh, we don't take it easy. Uh, once there are any errors uh, associated with uh, uh, any, any aspect with the products, then we uh, really act on them. We communicate with the companies to do uh, any necessary changes to prevent those errors from happening again in the future. Um, then uh, I guess uh, with this, we want to um, uh, kind of uh, mention some stories about importance of engaging uh, patients. So in one incident, um, and it's, it's one unfortunate uh, incident, that the patient was prescribed uh, chloropromazine, uh, and this is a prescription of antipsychotic medication. And that uh, uh, patient was supposed to take that medicine, but by mistake, because it's look alike. If you see some of the letters in, in upper case and some are in lower case, uh, let me tell you that has been done uh, purposely because we want to differentiate those look alike medication names. And we call that in medication safety, Tolman lettering. So um, I have done that term and lettering intentionally because I want to bring to your attention how those two medication uh, look, they uh, look similar, uh, honestly. So by mistake, instead of administering the chlorpromazine to that patient, the chlorpromide uh, was dispensed and was administered to the patient. 
uh, when the nurse approached to uh, the patient to administer the uh, wrong medication, the um, the patient was trying to highlight that this is not the medication I'm uh, supposed to take. But then the nurse was so confident she's getting the right medication. And she thought uh, it's a different brand name of the same drug. So she was assuring the patient, this is your medication, but it's just uh, from a different company. And uh, it wasn't. And because the second one uh, or the second medication here on the list is uh, an oral hypoglycemic agent, so this patient experienced anoxic brain damage from a sustained hypoglycemia uh, because of uh, that mistake. So sometimes we have really to be alarmed by patients because um, at certain a point, uh, we have to all agree that patients is the most knowledgeable one of their uh, own medication, especially if they're uh, chronic uh, diseases patients, because that's something they really used to do day by day. So they really grasp their medication very well. So we have to be really careful. So um, I mentioned this story intentionally because I was thinking there are so many factors that could have affected the nurse judgment in that case, uh, given that this patient was uh, um, uh, getting the antipsychotic, maybe because of the medical condition that patient is having, uh, the nurse might have been given the excuse to believe that he could be mistakenly thinking it's a different drug, but it wasn't. So sometimes when the uh, patients uh, alarm us as a healthcare provider, we, we really need to listen to what they're saying. Well, um, next. So uh, I guess just hearing to that story, maybe Dr. Sultan would agree with me that sometimes, sometimes in, in patient engagement, one plus one doesn't equal two. Uh, and I would love to hear from Dr. Sultan because we were debating that even when we were doing the, uh, we were preparing for this webinar. So Dr. Sultan. Well, thank you very much, Adil. Well, it's, it's quite uh, interesting. And yes, uh, I believe that uh, many people can argue that one plus one, it's not always equivalent or equal to. Uh, the story that you mentioned, uh, Ghadir, is a very sad story. A uh, very sad story that the the healthcare professional or the nurse in this case uh, she she didn't believe the patient and yeah, you know, what happened uh, is hap yeah, I mean, okay. that happened you know yeah yeah the tragedy happened so yes uh, uh, actually you know I will I will share with you the uh, one of the very common uh, story happened I mean, for many people many of us. Uh, luckily, alhamdulillah, that we have um, extended family uh, supporting it, uh, each other. This is a very good, great. I noticed that, you know, uh, one of the, uh, of the patients, so she's an uh, old lady. Uh, mashallah, she had, you know, quite uh, um, many, uh, too many kids, too many children, uh, almost, mashallah, uh, eight, seven. And... You know, they, mashallah, tabarakallah, they are, uh, they are trying, uh, yani they are shifting uh, to take care of her in teams, team one, team two, and team three. Uh, everyone try to, to help, to support his, uh, yani his and her mother. But they did great. The thing that when the patient admitted to the hospital, uh, usually team one will be, you know, uh, responsible to take care of the lady uh, in the hospital. So they will stay, will be connected and engaged with the, uh, healthcare providers, uh, the plan, they will listen to details, they will take all the instructions that, that they are trying their best. And actually also the healthcare provided is a very excellent, good healthcare provided. The, the plan is good. Uh, everything, you know, starting from the diagnosis to, to giving the uh, uh, correct medication, telling the instructions. So every step is a perfect, mashallah. And the caregivers, understand, totally understand, supporting their mother, you know, doing their best to, to the maximum, you know, uh, for, for taking care of their mother and everything is good. But there is miscommunication between the siblings, so between team one and team two. So when their mother at home and when the shift, the shift changes, you know, from, from the elder, you know, sisters to the, the younger ones, things, you know, uh, going upside down. 
So medication will be duplicated. Uh, the 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 um, you know they didn't attend the instructions, and they took the instructions not directly from the healthcare providers. They took it you know from someone else. The, the, so no one, you know, check their understanding at that time. So the medication that meant to be one every other day, they just, you know, give it to their mother uh, two times a day, uh, leading to, to uh, you know, that medication was uh, nitroglycerin, if I'm mistaken. The, the patient was already on two uh, hypertensive medication. So, yeah, you can guess, you know, what happened. Mother, you know, uh, she 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 was, you know, a regular, you know, client to to the ER for having this slow hypertension for unclear reason, you know, unclear reason. So when the physician or the healthcare providers asking, you know, start to take history, collateral history from everybody, they found out that the instruction wasn't clear to everybody. So yes, the. Uh, what we are trying here, me and uh, Ghadir, to, to tell that, you know, one plus one, when you having a very good uh, system and you're trying your best to, to, to do everything, you know, to the patient, explaining, uh, being there for the patient, uh, support, and everything is right. Sometimes there is things, yani, uh, you didn't yani, uh, plan for it, uh, it will show up. So, uh, yeah, there is, uh, there is, uh, confound, confounding factors might uh, affect the, the patient uh, outcome. So that's the, yani, we need to take this, uh, we need to take care of this and to keep it in mind. So take home messages. Actually, uh, the take home messages that we would like to, to focus here on is that there is a challenges uh, in engaging patients. So as we said, me and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Badir, that there is patient-related, uh, cultural, educational, cost, uh, personal motivation, and we have uh, the healthcare provider-related leadership support, uh, time, uh, there is no enough time, and participation in interdisciplinary team, the cultural, the cultural uh, change, the uh, man uh, power. Also, we spoke about uh, many patient engagement tools, that it might help. And we need to focus on one thing that the, uh, it's um, the, the, the patient-centered uh, care. We need to, 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 to make the patient as the center of the care, uh, involved in every step, understand uh, his concerns, his question, queries, and also to, to pay attention to the caregivers that are uh, responsible to, to help us in delivering the, the suitable care. Uh, last thing that I would like to, you know, to speak about a bit is the setting-based uh, tools. We will speak about it, inshallah, later. But in general, that we have different uh, uh, settings of delivering care. Uh, Hospital-based, home care, uh, clinic-based. So in each one of these uh, uh, settings, there's different uh, uh, process, uh, different engagement uh, mechanism that we can utilize and to, to assure the patient, um, you know, having the best uh, care and the patient are, you know, in the center of uh, that uh, care. Thank you very much, all. Uh, please, Makia. Thank you so much, Dr. Sultan and Dr. Ghadir. I think uh, it's not only me. I'm considering myself usually as an ambassador for and re representative for the patient, but also our participants here are so happy for the catchy title and the conversation between you and Dr. Ghadir. There is uh, a very nice comment from one of our participants. They said, Shaab al Masri, shkirkum ala hadi al muhadar al jamila. So <laughs> thank you so much. Glad to hear that. Ala rasin Shaab al Masri, Allah yakum alayhi wa Allah. So um, let's go to the second part of our webinar. It will be a heated discussion. Um, I would like to hear from you, our participant, if you have any questions or any debate during our uh, uh, questions and answer with Dr. Ghadir and Dr. Sultan. So um, my answer to you, uh, my questions to you, sorry, Dr. Ghadir, uh, as all we know that we have a very complex system 
can you share with us how the switches model framework could be considered while uh, building the system to support the team efforts? So as you know that every one of us have a lot of efforts, how these efforts could be fill the holes in this cheese and make a difference in reducing drug adverse event. Well, uh, thank you, Makia. I would I would say that uh, the Swiss cheese model is one of the concepts that I really admire. And I guess anyone here works in quality or medication safety will will have the same will share the same feeling with me. Um, basically, the Swiss cheese model was um, developed by James Reason back in 2020. So we're talking about more than two decades ago. And um, yet it's a very valid uh, concept when we talk about medication safety. So if we're talking about different um, stages of medication use or uh, processes, every slice of this cheese um, uh, is representing a layer that could prevent the hazard from reaching out to the patient. But unfortunately, when we build our systems, there are always holes, and those holes, we call them latent failure. So the holes in the cheese you are seeing in front of you, they represent the latent failures, which are like defects in the system that you don't really know about unless, unfortunately, something happened. It doesn't have to reach to the patient. Well, let's make this very clear. Sometimes it doesn't reach to the patient yet, but you came to know about it like in between, and then you could fix those holes in the system. And then maybe because you're doing those changes to fix those holes, you could create another ones. <laughs> you never know. Like you have always to have those ongoing uh, performance improvement activities to uh, ensure that you are delivering the safest possible care. Uh, one of the things I would really encourage um, like um, people to look at is, um, the key elements of the medication use system. Well, uh, those 10 key elements from the ISMP, if you just Google that, ISMP, key elements of the medication use system, or 10 key elements, I'm sure you will get the results and what I'm talking about. Well, those like holes in the system could represent one of the 10 key elements. So basically they talk about patient information, drug information. If you have any defect in any of those 10 key elements, then errors could happen. But the very interesting thing, among all those 10 key elements, they have something very specific about patient education. So they believe one of the 10 key elements, uh, when you do your analysis, whenever medication errors happen, sometimes, or maybe most of the times, it depends on how, how like you really pay so much attention in your system to patients and patient education, they could be relevant to this error to happen. So patients has always to receive those ongoing education from physicians, from pharmacists, from nursing, from any staff engaged in, in the medication use process. So they will be our partner in, in preventing errors. So I guess our talk today is all about empowering them because we want them to be our partners. We don't want them to feel like uh, they're just receiver of this care. No, they're here with us to support that they get the safe uh, the safest possible care um, and, and health uh, system. That's awesome, uh, Dr. Ghadir. So um, supporting this uh, say, would you think that if we ask our participant, whoever um, participating with how many, um, how many of us still now resistant that patient is not, is not an active partner in the healthcare system and who is really supporting that patient should be a co, uh, a co really a developer and a co-designer in each process. So if you would just keep on raising hand, I think this will be uh, quite convincing after this one hour and 12 minutes. Um, back to you, Dr. Sultan. Um, I would like to ask if um, medication discrepancies impact almost every patient that moves. Across transition of care, what outlines could you just share our participant to improve medication safety? Uh, thank you for this great uh, question. And mashallah, I noticed that you spoke about uh, Swiss cheese and now it's the dinner time. So yeah, I know what I will have for dinner today. <laughs> You're hungry, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Maki, again for this uh, 
uh, question. Uh, let me please speak a bit about the settings based uh, uh, tools that, uh, as I mentioned before, that we have uh, different settings of delivering care. So, um, and if we spoke about in home health care, here we have uh, a very important ally uh, that will help us uh, as a healthcare uh, practitioners, you know, to making a, a patient as a center of care. So, we need to have uh, a very active uh, caregiver or caregivers that who uh, grasp and understand the the, uh, the the care plan or the plan of care and that they are taking you know um, they are actively involved in delivering um, and surrounding a patient with the care that's needed so that uh, in every time the, the the healthcare team visiting the home uh, will make sure things are uh, you know going uh, uh, great or as uh, uh, as it's planned so yeah in home health care settings, it's different than the other uh, settings. Uh, we have the caregivers that uh, involved in, in delivering care, and the the need to 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 be the connection between the home uh, the home health care team or the care providers here and the patient receiving the care. Right. The other uh, setting is the hospital, uh, where we have uh, inpatient, you know, and the complexity of care uh, of patient. We have here also body pharmacy. Uh, we have, uh, well, sometimes we have uh, different uh, teams caring for patients, patient, you know, under medicine, and there is cons consultation or referral uh, and from different uh, departments. So, yeah, we need to, to, to pay attention. As I told you the, the story before, sometimes that we have everything planned, everything good, but uh, we have confounders like that and patients have uh, multiple caregivers, not all of them aware of the care plan so the uh, might mistake you know medication might you know increase or add or delete you know medication because that we believe this is the the best thing we have this difficulty of uh, different uh, as i told you uh, caregivers patient are uh, uh, seeking uh, you know advice or health care from different uh, health care providers uh, everyone giving you medication and luckily alhamdulillah we have now nipco uh, things are clear and sorted uh, before you know, we had, you know, same medication, different packages, different uh, generic name, uh, causing a confuse to the patient and to the, to the caregivers. Uh, the third settings is the is the clinic, where here we have less complexity, you know, of the patient case. Uh, we have, you know, uh, uh, an accessible, easy access to healthcare. Uh, so things may, might might be you know easier. The, the fourth thing you know the most quite yeah, the interesting for me is the telemedicine. You know, as me and my colleague Ghadir went through the literature, we found that interestingly, that uh, telemedicine uh, prescription, uh, you know, has the 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 least uh, or or very very quiet, very little uh, medication error, in opposite to 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 you know general thinking or general. Uh, belief of that telemedicine, we we don't have you know control of the medication and the patient identity and these things. So I believe one of the arguments can be that patient will have uh, this electronic prescription. So the prescription will be written you know electronically, uh, no mistakes, uh, no difficulty you know, in reading the the prescription like the old you know the 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 handwriting uh, prescriptions. Uh, one thing is that. The the uh, the physician or the provider might have uh, in a supporting uh, system, you know, of suggesting uh, modifying the 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 uh, the medication, the prescription. Uh, people uh, or patients who are seeking that medicine uh, might be you know more educated, uh, and this has you know something you know uh, with their adherence and their you know asking. Uh, 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 right questions, as my uh, my my colleague Khadir mentioned before. So these elements, you know, might you know, uh, uh, yani, yani this uh, I mean, these different settings might affect the 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 patient, uh, uh, you know, uh, participation and engagement. So back to your question, uh, Makia. So medication safety and transition of care, um, as you can see in this, you know, beautiful uh, diagram, that. Uh, we need in the beginning to to appropriately prescribing, and uh, you know assessing the risk of the medication, 
we need to review uh, medication. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm very advocate, you know, to review medication and every visit. We need to involve patient, we need to review things, we need to empower patient, engage patient, so we will end up with a good outcome. So back to the diagram. So third stage is dispensing uh, preparation and uh, administration, then uh, communicating uh, communication and patient engagement. As I said before, patient is the center of care. Patient supposed to be uh, aware, responsible, and held accountable by engaging uh, them and, and their uh, care. Lastly, medication reconciliation, and we spoke about it uh, before, uh, at care uh, transition. So uh, I hope uh, that I answered your question. And if you allow me, Makia, please, yani, uh, we, we, we have read about the patient, uh, Saudi patient safety uh, caravan. It's very nice. Uh, if you don't mind, please, just to share you know, some ideas about it to, to our uh, fellows who, 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 who want to, to know more about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sultan. I would love to uh, speak briefly about the patient safety caravan. Actually, it's, um, it's an empowerment tool. It's, uh, and it has been proved it's successful uh, as we piloted in our kingdom in six regions. And it was uh, really shown how it is improving the patient safety culture by empowering patients about their health status and helping them to reach safer health care for all by encouraging them with um, a designed questions during uh, their hospitalization or during their being in waiting areas, emergency, etc. So uh, it has been really shown that how it could be as a tool for empowerment and help also the healthcare providers, how they improve their communication between uh, between them and family, uh, patient and their families as well. Actually, um, they told us we get used to talk to our patient, but we never uh, like exercise how really to encourage them to ask us the right questions. So I'm, I'm really um, uh, inviting everyone who is uh, really interested to know more that they can visit it, uh, SPC website to know more about the caravan. And there is a good news that we are spreading this um, again uh, because it has been piloted before COVID and now it is spreading uh, in different clusters around the kingdom. And it has been also piloted in Pakistan with uh, with WHO Collaborative Center. So uh, I think uh, it's a quite enough information, Dr. Sultan. Yeah, this is very interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sultan. Uh, a great effort. Uh, thank you very much. I will be the first person to read about it more and more. And yeah, uh, this is quite interesting. We, we also are happy to, to be the coach, and we are now conducting a TOT training for hospitals who are really uh, interesting to make it as a sustainable empowerment tool. Nice. nice. Can you, Dr. Sultan, go next slide, please? Yeah, please. So um, I think we have a really uh, good questions. Okay, this is, I think, the part of Dr. Khadir. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so far we have covered so many uh, things about like the Swiss cheese model, the holes in the system, the latent failures. And then we have moved uh, uh, through the transition of cares and how in every different setting we have different tools to use in order to empower patients. But um, I'd love to share even those like numbers with uh, our audience. Uh, if we think about the medication use processes, um, like prescribing, transcribing, dispensing, and administration of medication, usually we would see like different um, data on those uh, stages and medication errors and potential for harm uh, associated with uh, each step. So uh, it's quite interesting to see that prescribing uh, in terms of potential for harm is scoring 63% uh, uh, percent in this uh, study. But then if you look at the numbers in terms of interception, the error, and uh, not being able to intercept the error before it reached to the patient, then we'll find that during the administration stage, we have the high likelihood of not intercepting the error, which means if we don't uh, code the error, then 84% uh, of those errors would reach to the patient. 
if you look at the uh, dates of those uh, data I'm using is it's almost like 10 years ago around that time. So um, I believe like with all what we have heard today, um, if we empower a patient, because we're talking about administration stage being the most highly, uh, high likely uh, step when errors cannot be intercepted, but by empowering patient, definitely we could score a lower percentage here because patients will be uh, one of the uh, layers. Now we have added more layer of protection. Uh, so the uh, harm will not uh, get to the patient or the error won't get to the patient. There are definitely some even improvement in technologies we have seen around this uh, step of the medication use process like the uh, BCMA, which is the barcode medication administration. We have seen the smart pump, the use of smart pump uh, for uh, uh, infusing um, the parenteral medications, but yet we should ne never forget about um, uh, patients. And I always love to think of it that way. Uh, machines, technology are never there to replace humans. We can, we can never say that uh, having those uh, technology advancement is a replacement for human just simply because human are the one who have created them. <laughs> so uh, patience definitely is one of your armor. If, if you are um, empowering them, then uh, definitely this percentage. I'm, I'm pretty sure if we do that study um, again after all the efforts we are trying to do, um, and the movement of empowering patients, definitely I'm, I'm kind of leaned to, toward having a lower percentage of error not intercepted during administration step. Oh, very interesting, Wada. That's awesome. I think I can feel really how energetic you, Dr. Sultan and Dr. Ghadir, about uh, empowering patient. And really it, it shows how patient advocacy is within your DNA. So it is. It is. Um, I would just uh, like to take the questions of our participant. We have um, Joanne Joy. Uh, she is asking why. Uh, what is the importance of disclosing medication error to a patient, as it can affect patient trust in the healthcare system? Well, Doctor, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would. I would like just have like my two cents on this. And I would love even to hear from uh, Dr. Sultan as well, definitely. Uh, well, I have read that on the Q&A um, and I have been thinking in, in, in a way that we, we have done all this like webinar thinking, patient is the center of our care, but not disclosing error uh, to patients. And there are a lot of uh, research published in that area. I mean, about even disclosing error if no harm happened, disclosing error if harm happened, uh, regardless of the severity of error, um, I'm, I'm totally in with uh, disclosing errors to patients. Because if we're talking about empowering uh, patients, then definitely they have always to be the center of our care. Hiding information from patient, it means there are something uh, center to that care rather than the patient themselves. So if we are trying to uh, convince patients that they're the center of our care and then hiding information, definitely we are delivering the opposite message totally. Uh, regarding the point of losing trust in healthcare, well, for so long we have been having this, uh, I like the expression that Dr. Sultan has mentioned, of parenting hood between the patients and healthcare provider. Well, we have to reach to an agreement that we healthcare provider are not parenting uh, patients. They have to question, like for, for so long, patients in our culture were thinking um, it's a taboo to say to a physician, he might be wrong. And we have to change that culture. If we don't have the patient empowered enough and we don't tell them that even healthcare provider could do mistakes, uh, system could fail, the, could fail us, then we'll never get to uh, that stage of total empowerment to patients. Um, that's, that's how I see it. And uh, I don't know if Dr. Sultan, you would like to add anything more or Makia, definitely. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ghadir, for, for writing this uh, nice ideas. Yes, um, I'm advocate actually to disclose any mistakes uh, uh, to the patient because as you tell, uh, as you said, uh, Ghadir, it's, uh, it's a patient-centered kid, right? So we need to involve patient and every uh, steps uh, happened or we are planning, you know, uh, in his skill. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, uh, being you know, since we are saying that, we need to to appreciate the sensitivity, uh, uh, you know, relationship between the, the the doctor or the healthcare practitioner and the patient by telling them. Uh, and I came across you know many research that uh, that uh, mentioned that the the uh, the uh, uh, many of the suitcase. Uh, you know, again, it's the healthcare uh, system, healthcare practitioners, uh, in terms of medication error, uh, because that the patient and he, uh, uh, didn't know about it, and there there there, there was no uh, disclosure of the uh, mistakes or medication error happened. So people or patient, I mean, take it very seriously that you know lying in front of them or lying to them without telling them uh, disclosing the the full truth, and people or sorry, patient would understand, you know. Uh, that the health uh, care professionals uh, did their best and we are human beings and mistakes happen. You know, unintended mistakes, if it happened, people will tend to, to forgive that. But intended mistake happen, you know, uh, people wouldn't tolerate that. So yes, this is my opinion. Thank you. So um, what about the, that if really we have a health care providers now, they are convincing of um, how really important to empower patient. What kind of training and tools that they could have to, to empower patient more? Well, I would say from what we have discussed in the tools, like I will just go through them really quick, like the five questions to ask, the basic questions, all those tools of, of if they could um, extend them to patients and um, empower them with the right questions to ask, then definitely that's great. Um, uh, to summarize what uh, tools Dr. Sultan was entertaining during the presentation, like the medication reconciliation, uh, having uh, the brown bag check of uh, events, uh, teaching them to carry their medications all the time whenever they're visiting the clinic, the uh, um, going to the hospital for admission, uh, or the ER, or even um, uh, during, uh, but definitely we have to highlight that if they're getting admitted, they have to get their medication back to home, but they have to bring it just uh, in the initial assessment to be uh, reviewed by physicians and uh, clinical pharmacists, if they're a clinical pharmacist on the team. Um, what else Dr. Sultan has mentioned is the uh, adherence of patients and uh, the great link he was explaining about non-adhering to medication will lead to uh, error because to medical errors because we could see uh, patients getting admitted because their hyper uh, uh, their hypertension their blood pressure is not controlled and all of those kind of uh, medication errors and medical errors happen because of their non-adherence to uh, medications. I don't know uh, if. I get your question right, Makaya, or? Uh... Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I would um, like to add something here, if you don't mind. Sure, Doctor. Yeah, I believe by attending you know, such webinar, uh, the great effort that, uh, mashallah, uh, you guys do it in the Saudi Patient Safety Center is a useful tool just to remind ourselves, you know, me, uh, Dr. Ghadir, you, Makaya, and all the participants, we are reminding ourselves of the uh, of the, you know, uh, urgent uh, need uh, to, to pay attention, to focus on engaging patient in every step. Uh, to minimize, you know, medication error, we need to engage patient. More engagement, meaning that uh, less, you know, uh, error. Thank you. That's an awesome. Um, I think um, back to the study, Dr. Ghadir, you have mentioned during uh, presentation about the National Patient Safety Foundation, uh, there is a question here if there is a similar study in our kingdom. Honestly the... speaking, we I haven't come across any, and I was really interested to see the answers from our audience. It seems like someone else has come across something I'm not uh, familiar with or I'm not aware of. So if 
any of uh, our audience who have answered to our question uh, with yes, I will uh, I'll be happy to to see if they have the reference or the organization who have uh, published anything about it in, on a national level. But uh, for me, no. I believe also it can be, you know, a very rich environment uh, for, for studies. So uh, we might have a researchers or at least a research idea today if, uh, if people are interested. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Because it's, it's a simple like uh, survey and even uh, they have conducted that in the US uh, uh, using just uh, US uh, mail service, uh, emailing uh, the uh, uh, participants uh, using telephone call and uh, interviewing them face to face. So uh, it's just a simple survey uh, tools that they have uh, used. Yeah, uh, Yeah, I believe that it's a very simple survey with, you know, uh, magnificent, magnificent, you know, uh, outcome uh, yes, by the end. Definitely. And I believe that the Saudi Patient uh, Safety Center are interested in these uh, topics. So people who who's interested, uh, I believe they can, you know, just reach to the uh, SPSC uh, and, you know, let them know they, they, they might have, you know, uh, ideas uh, of participation for, for such, you know, activity. Uh, I totally agree, Dr. Sultan. Actually, we have just recruited a new head section for research. So we are working now into research and we are um, building up this um, the capacity of the of the department. And uh, we are really inviting whoever is interested to just reach us. So uh, we can um, conduct a lot of researches related to the same topic. Mashallah, it does. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sultan and Dr. Ghadir for addressing this interesting topic. Um, actually, uh, if you can go next, Dr. Sultan. Um, uh, we are also um, inviting you to register for the fifth National Patient Safety Award, which is open now, and the deadline will be the end of uh, September. So SPC also remind you to the upcoming webinar that's aligned with the World Patient Safety Day kindly uh, just visit our website so you can see the schedule. And on behalf of Saudi Patient Safety Center, I would like to thank Dr. Sultan Al-Houthi and Dr. Ghadir Banasser and our audience for their active participation. As a part of Saudi Patient Safety Center efforts to provide you for a timely topics and interesting speakers, we would appreciate to fill the evaluation which will be sent through email. Thank you for joining us today and we will look forward for the welcoming you back in the future webinar.